is a recent volcanic eruption in the state of Hawaii. There's enough power there to turn a forest into a wasteland. Enough to bury a complete village. Enough to change the size and shape of an entire state. We'll find out more about how these islands were formed today when Discovery takes a first-hand look at Hawaii, land of volcanoes. Discovery 67, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen and Virginia Gibson. Hi, and welcome to Discovery. Today we've come to Hilo on the island of Hawaii. It's a small city, not much bigger than a large town. You might walk through Hilo's town square and imagine that you were in a county seat in Ohio or Indiana. It's an American town, all right, Bill. But a short walk away from this square, you'd soon begin to realize that there's a lot here that's different from what you might see in most towns on the mainland. Although it's small by mainland standards, Hilo is the largest city in the island of Hawaii, and it's the county seat of the county of Hawaii. But its citizens come from a surprising variety of places. There are Filipinos here, a couple of days a week, there are Filipino movies playing in Hilo's motion picture theaters. The next night, the films may be Japanese, because about 75% of the population on the island of Hawaii is of Japanese extraction. There are Tahitians here, Chinese, and Tongans, in addition to Hawaiians and people from the mainland. And where there are different kinds of people, you find different kinds of habits and customs. You can see the differences in street signs, grocery stores, and restaurants. One of the most famous sites in Hilo is right here, in front of the Hawaii County Library. This huge rectangular stone is called the Naha Stone, and it was originally put in front of the Temple of Pinau as a test for chiefs to prove that they belong to the royal family. If you did belong to that royal family, Bill, you were supposed to be able to turn over this heavy stone all by yourself. And according to legend, King Kamehameha was able to accomplish this feat, and the story has endured for hundreds of years. The islands that make up the state of Hawaii stretch 1,500 miles across the central Pacific Ocean. They're only tiny dots on any map of the Pacific. And in reality, they're the tops of a range of great mountains. But together, they make up our newest state. Scientists claim that the state of Hawaii is built on top of the greatest mountain range on Earth. The lowest of the mountains, which make up the Hawaiian islands, rise 15,000 feet from the ocean floor. And the largest of them, the mountain called Mauna Kea, here on the island of Hawaii, rises almost 30,000 feet above its base. About 13,000 feet of it is above sea level. These are the Hawaiian islands, eight principal islands running from north to south. Kauai, Nihihau, Oahu, Molokai, Lanai, Kahoholawe, Maui, and this one, where we are, Hawaii. Hawaii is called the Big Island, but they could also call it the New Island because it's the most recently formed. As a matter of fact, it isn't even finished yet. None of this would be here. Not a palm tree, not a fine hotel, not a tourist, not even the people of Hawaii themselves, were it not for a period of violent volcanic activity which created these islands in dramatic scenes like these. Many of the secrets of her origins up here in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. This is what a volcano looks like when it's not steaming and boiling and pushing its way through the Earth's crust. This crater is called Kilauea Iki. It's quiet down there, but that doesn't mean there's nothing going on. Everything around us is testimony to the power of the fiery molten mass which lies under the surface of the Hawaiian Islands, ready at any moment to make itself felt again. These are ohia trees, or they were before the 1959 eruption, which turned a verdant forest into a charred ruin in just a few fiery hours. 
What lies between them isn't soil. There's very little pure soil on the island of Hawaii. And here it isn't lava either. It's ash blown out of the crater in the form of red hot cinders during violent eruptions and explosions. That little hill is new too. It isn't a hill at all really, but a cinder heap blown up here 400 feet by the violence of the subsurface convulsions that were going on down there. This is what the same crater, Kilauea Eaton, looked like on the night of November 14, 1959. That's how Kilauea Iki came to look as it does at this moment. But how long will the crater stay this way? There could be a new eruption at any time. What can we learn about future eruptions by studying the conditions created by the last one? Well, Jenny, there are scientists of the U.S. Geological Survey working on the floor of the lava lake right now to find out some of the answers. And we'll join them down there in just a minute. In order to understand more about the formation of these islands, the geologists of the U.S. Geological Survey go into the craters of Hawaii's volcanoes from time to time to measure and study the changes that are constantly taking place down there. Today, we're going with them down 400 feet into Kilauea Iki to take the temperature of the molten mass underneath the surface of the lava lake. It isn't particularly difficult getting into the crater of Kilauea Iki but it would be if the men had to carry all of their tools and equipment on their backs. So they've devised a tram line to take the heavier pieces to the bottom. One of the ways the men up top know their equipment has reached the bottom is by watching the shadow of the pack as it moves across the crater floor. By the time you get halfway down, you can pretty clearly make out the geological equipment, which for some months now has been a visible feature of the floor of the lava lake. What the men of the U.S. Geological Survey have been doing here is very much like the work that goes on in potential oil fields before the digging of a well. The crater of Kilauea Iki has become a laboratory for these geologists. By studying the nature of this lake of lava, they can add knowledge to man's limited store of information concerning the formation and future of these islands, and perhaps some information as well on how the rest of the Earth was formed. Under this crunchy, brittle crust, there's a bright red vein of molten rock. If you pick up a bit of the cooled and hardened crust, you'll see it resembles something that might have come out of an old-fashioned furnace. This is the solidified form of the molten basalt, which rose from deep within the Earth's crust. But the geologists would still like to know what's going on beneath the surface. Here, near the center of the crater, the geologists have drilled a three and a half inch hole into the hardened crust on top of this lava lake. They have bored down almost to the point where the rock is molten. Today, they're going to take the temperature of the matter 80 feet below. In order to test the temperature beneath the surface, the geologists, like Dr. Richard Fisk, use a long snake-like rod called a thermocouple. The thermocouple is now on the bottom, and we can read the temperature of the material near the base of the crust. Running through this sheathing are two wires of slightly different alloy compositions. These wires are welded together just at the bottom of the thermocouple. The great heat down there generates a tiny electrical voltage, which passes up the wires, and we measure this voltage here with the potentiometer. Now, if I measure this voltage right now, we see that the temperature at the bottom of the hole is about 1,000 degrees centigrade, or 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. It's actually possible to see the molten lava glowing brightly 80 feet down in the drill hole. From the surface, it looks as if we're actually looking into the center of the Earth. The next part of the job is to deepen the hole and send the drill bit down for a sample of the molten material. 
Because the drill has to be water-cooled at all times to keep it from being destroyed at the high temperatures, the melt turns to solidified material almost as soon as the drill bit reaches it. In just a few minutes, the drill bit will come out. When it does, it'll bring a cylinder of solidified melt with it. Here's a drill bit that came out just a few moments ago. Now, this must be the core sample here, right, Dick? That's right, Bill. It's hard already. No, oh, yeah. Well, just a few minutes ago, this was uh, partly molten. Exactly why are you geologists so concerned with these particular core samples? Well, here in uh, Kilauea Iki, we have the unique opportunity to study basaltic rocks in the process of forming. And this has already given us a great deal of information about the origin of Kilauea volcano, about the origin of the Hawaiian Islands, and furthermore, about the origin of basaltic rocks all over the world. There's always activity beneath the surface here because the five volcanoes which created this island of Hawaii, this volcano island, haven't finished their work yet. This is one of the best places in the world for the study of volcanoes, and the tools for that study are all around us. There are 12 devices called seismometers placed at various locations around Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Each of them is attached to a seismograph back in the observatory on the rim of the great crater of Kilauea. Earth movements produce a response which is registered instantly by the pens moving across these drums of smoked paper. Those smoke paper drums are conventional seismographs, which are still in use, but even better are the new film techniques. Now the impulses from the seismometers are recorded on film, and you can see them clearly on this viewing screen. This equipment is designed to record volcanic activity, and yet it will also record a passing truck or a bulldozer working in a field. Dick, how do you know which is which? Well, it's fairly easy if we look here at the record. We see several different things. At the top, the traces are seen to be slightly wiggly. This is just noise picked up by the seismometers all the time. But here we see the trace made by the bulldozer operating about two miles away from the seismometer here at the observatory. It is a con continuous jagged trace indicating that the bulldozer was operating over this period of time. On the other hand, here is an earthquake. It arrives abruptly at a number of different seismometers scattered wide, widely over the summit of the volcano. It also produces jagged lines, but these lines gradually tail out and disappear. Well, Dick, we've been down in the crater, we've walked on the surface of a lava lake, and we've seen how a seismograph works. But what goes on beneath the surface? Well, let me show you, Bill. Here's a very simplified cross-section of Kilauea volcano. The first thing you'll notice is that the volcano we see above sea level is only a very small part of the total mountain. Actually, the slopes of the volcano extend down to a depth of 18 or 19,000 feet below sea level. Now, the enormous amount of lava that builds this pile is generated at a depth of about 40 miles. And if we were to draw this here on this section, we would have to do it below the level of the blackboard here. This lava rises up and accumulates in a shallow chamber at a depth of about two or three miles below the summit of the volcano. As the lava accumulates here, it causes the entire summit of the volcano to inflate. Well, Dick, how do you know it's inflated? Well, we have various methods for measuring this inflation. We measure the inflation with tilt meters. We measure it with a geotometer that very accurately determines the amount of horizontal expansion as the inflation takes place. And we also run precise level lines over the summit of the volcano. And from the combination of these three methods, we found that the volcano has inflated more than two feet since the last eruption. Dick, with all your scientific information and instruments, are you able to tell when the next eruption will actually take place? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, the volcano does not operate on any kind of a timetable. <laughs> After each eruption, or during each eruption, there are some changes at depth, some faulting movement of the structure of the volcano, 
And so as the volcano inflates the next time, we are never really sure just how much inflation will have to take place before the lava can break through to the surface. Now, you can't tell when it will take place. How about where? Can you tell us that? Well, again, we cannot pinpoint any spot, but there, the eruptions fall into two main classes. The first are what we call summit eruptions. The lava leaves the shallow reservoir here and moves nearly vertically to the summit of the volcano and erupts in or near the summit caldera here, just outside of the observatory. Or another type of eruption is one in which the lava travels underground for as much as 30 miles east of the summit and erupts on the flank of the volcano. This, just this kind of eruption took place in 1960 and completely devastated the town of Kapoho. So that's how a volcano erupts. But what do you think it would be like if you actually lived in the path of a lava flow? We'll find out in just a minute. In Hawaii, there are two kinds of lava flows. The more common of them is called pahoahoa, and it means the rather rope-like form of lava which spreads out across so much of Hawaii. It's pahoahoa lava we're standing on right now. In 1960, there was a town here, a town called Kapoho. On January 14th of that year, an eruption broke out in the crater of Kilauea, only one quarter mile north of Kapoho Village. For a few hours, the line of small lava fountains was half a mile long, but eventually the flow concentrated and resulted in a huge double fountain, at times reaching a height of 1,500 feet. A Pahoehoe flow destroyed a papaya grove while crumbling lava advanced through a field. Lava poured eastward into the ocean and spread out, covering an area of four square miles. Lava flows like these can move at the rate of 20 miles per hour. Most of Kapoho Village was destroyed. The eruption, which had begun on January 14th, finally ended on the 19th of February. A village was lost. Valuable agricultural land was lost. But at the end of the eruption, there were some 500 acres of new land. Land that had been created by lava pouring into the sea. Not too far from the village of Kapoho is South Point, the southernmost part of the United States. South Point is still growing, and as long as there's volcanic activity on the island of Hawaii, chances are it'll continue to grow, because it's in the line of lava flow. Of Hawaii's five major volcanoes, Three of them are still classed as active. Until they are termed extinct or even dormant, no map of Hawaii will really be permanent. The story of lava and volcanoes has a violent and terrifying beginning, but the end of the story is something else again. It's hard to believe that much good could come from the rubble which is left on the earth after an eruption. It's burned out, dry, and seemingly useless. But that's not the whole story. In case the green and rich portion of the Big Island didn't tell us enough, there's an area within Volcanoes National Park which gives us a happy ending to the story of volcanic eruption. This is Kipuka Pualu, which the park department calls Bird Park. A Kipuka is an old lava flow which has decomposed, but which has not been covered over by new outpourings of lava. Once in the past, this Kipuka was as barren and hopeless as the new land at the tip of South Point. Some of the history of volcanoes is contained in the Kipuka, and so is some of the history of the Hawaiian people. This fern is called hapu'u. Its young fronds, before they're unfurled, are curled toward the center of the parent plant. They're covered with a substance called pulu. This pulu is a little like a moist brown cotton. Soldiers took it into battle as part of their first aid kit, and mothers used it to cradle the heads of their new babies. Inside the untroubled green lushness of the Kipuka, and out here where the earth steams and smells of sulfur, it's all part of the volcanic time capsule, which is the island of Hawaii. These are the Aloy Hotfields, and they were named after the pet pig, the wayward husband of the Hawaiian goddess of the volcanoes, Pele. <laughs> the Hawaiians believed that the goddess Pele determined when the earth would open and pour out fire and liquid rock. When will it happen again? Geologists say that it's overdue right now. 
the pressures have built up to the point where, by rights, it ought to have happened already. And a few weeks after we filmed this program, it did happen. Kilauea began to erupt on November 5th. The most active volcano in the world lived up to its name, and about 20 million cubic yards of lava began spewing out of vents from the floor of Halimamau Crater, which is at the summit of Kilauea Volcano. At one time, the molten lava rose to 100 feet in height. In a traditional ceremony, some Hawaiians, to keep Pele quiet and happy, go every year to the edge of Kilauea and throw in offerings of pork, peely grass, and red fern, and a tiny fish with a long Hawaiian name, humu humu nuku nuku apua'a. <laughs> Credited to superstition or accident, Pele and her volcanoes are, for the moment, relatively quiet. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed today's visit to Volcanoes National Park. If you'd like to find out more about Hawaii, our 50th state, then ask your librarian for any of these books. Hawaii by Charles A. Borden, Hawaii Nei by Ruth M. Tabra, and this book, Kimo and Madame Pele by Virginia Nielsen. Be with us next week as Discovery continues to discover America. Bye-bye. Bye. The Discovery Unit's transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs.